My name is Andreas Ferber. I'm going to talk about porting OpenSUSE to MIPS. This is another talk from the missing manuals category about OBS. And uh, once again, it's not showing. Just a second. There we are. Okay, so before I start with the actual talk, um, a few words about this talk. So if you're already starting to, uh, to Google for OpenSUSE on MIPS um, because you're seeing the title of this talk, then you won't find any results for that yet. Um, there have been a number of previous talks about putting OpenSUSE to architectures, such as to um, ARMv7, um, ARMv6, and ARG64. Um, also, there's... Um, um, Jan was working on a port to Spark 64, and um, Andrea Schwab has been maintaining a port for Motorola 68K. But um, if at all, then people have been talking um, about the story that they have ported something in OpenSUSE. But what I was really missing is more detailed information on how do I actually port OpenSUSE to something new. So this talk will focus high, um, highly on the open build service and not so much on particularly the MIPS architecture. This is roughly the outline. First, I'm going to talk about porting OpenSUSE in general, then um, moving on to specifically for MIPS, the open build server setup that I've been using, um, and then the workers, and finally, the status of uh, where I have been lately. So, first of all, a thought. Why would anyone want to port OpenSUSE to a new architecture when it's working on, say, an Intel notebook, already on ARM servers and boards of all kinds? Well, um, many of us uh, really like OpenSUSE, or at least are used to OpenSUSE, and would like to run the same environment on the various hardware that we have access to. Um, then another aspect, of course, is learning how OBS and bootstrapping OpenSUSE um, actually works and what is actually like the core that makes up the distribution that we use every day. And um, also kind of as a side effect, um, I was interested in having a test setup specifically for um, KVM on MIPS, where I'm uh, working on KVM on my day job. And also, um, since uh, QMU is being used for um, as um, emulation front end for uh, for KVM, and this also has the side effect that the Linux user emulation of QMU can get some more testing. Um, when we're talking about bootstrapping a port, bootstrapping OpenSUSE, then this refers to um, that when we want to build a particular package, and I'm um, assuming that most of you have a rough idea about packaging regular packages for, for OpenSUSE, um, then if you take a look at a package such as RPM, then that package too has dependencies such as uh, GCC and probably even more. Um, whereas GCC, once again, depends on um, RPM for packaging the actual build results. So we have um, cyclic dependencies between individual packages. And the idea of a bootstrap is that we take a set of packages, I'm going to come to which those are later in the talk, and use those packages to um, rebuild those packages with the help of OBS um, so that we have an insurance that the package, uh, the resulting packages have actually been built from the sources that are checked into um, OBS. And obviously, once we have those core set of packages and um, building, then OBS can do the regular work um, that I guess we all know. So, as a... Uh, a, a first step, it is um, possible to import binary packages into the OBS server. There is documentation on that, both um, in the wiki and in manuals. So, for, for example, if you want to build packages for a new distribution, then you just um, can take, like, from a CD media all the RPM packages, copy them into a specific um, um, repository subfolder on the um, OBS server directory, and uh, from there on, you can use those packages to, uh, to build your packages against. Um, I've... Uh, written down for reference the uh, command that can be used in this particular case to um, import the binaries into such a colon full subdirectory. 
and um, this works by simply taking the um, actual um, RPM name and simplifying it to a form that um, OBS expects and making sure that OBS has access rights to, um, um, has the right permissions to access the files that uh, we've imported there. Now, obviously, once we know that we can import our RPM files to, um, for this way, that for the purpose of porting is, the big question is, where do we actually get the RPM files um, that we can do if the actual goal that we have is building RPM files that we can use on a particular platform? Um, so, um, for one part, any um, um, non-architecture-specific packages, those no arch RPM files can be imported right away since there is no architecture specific bits in there. And then, um, of course, there's um, the option of packaging either um, foreign or cross compiled binaries as RPM that RPM can, uh, that OBS can then um, continue to work with. So uh, one example of such foreign packages would be if there is already, say, a Debian distribution running on an architecture such as MIPS, might it be possible to use the Deb packages and just create RPM packages out of them that OBS can then um, continue um, working with. Alternatively, there is the option of just using um, the RPM tools itself for building an RPM. Um, I've tried that once or twice. Um, the example would be on um, this MIPS board here. This was um, recently launched. This is the uh, Creator CI20 um, by uh, MIPS using an Ingenix SOC. Um, I'm going to talk about the spec slide later. Um, so if you already have such a system working, then of course you have the possibility to build native packages if you have the right tools. Um, however, um, the dependencies that you have installed on such a system might not be exactly um, what um, um, OpenSUSE is expecting. And also the way that the RPM um, tool is configured, in particular the RPM build tool is configured on other distros, might also not be the exact way um, that our OBS um, OpenSUSE setup expects. Um, but when we're looking um, at um, building packages on our own, and in particular, you know, after the second or third package that I try to actually do this, um, it gets pretty um, boring and complicated and job, and um, obviously and the Open Build Service is a software that is primarily focused at building packages. So here the idea is, can we actually use OBS to build those base set of packages? What we would need for that, since um, the assumption is that OBS itself is not yet running on a MIPS architecture, is to use a cross-compiler. Um, but how does it actually work to use a cross-compiler for such packages in OBS? Um, one approach that had been there before for the ARM port was the so-called um, QMU Excel um, package. Um, the idea was that we could use, once we already had the bootstrap of an ARM port, that it was taking um, quite a lot of time to, to emulate things, and that was the reason why they tried to um, to uh, inject host binaries into the, um, the build image. So this package would actually take the um, x86-64 binaries, such as um, SED, bash, and so on, some that were frequently being used, and um, make sure that the um, host architectures binary were being used for the, um, for the non-native builds. Um, they were using um, the ice cream MGCC compiler environment um, to do so, and um, this package then gets aggregated from x86 architecture repository into the, in that case, um, ARM repository. The question where I was not quite so sure is whether this would actually work for an initial bootstrap. And um, I also heard from um, Dirk and the other people um, who had been working on that for the ARM port that it was very difficult to maintain over time so that they literally gave up on this particular approach. So uh, what other op um, opportunity is there? Um, that's kind of the, the obvious answer is to cross-compile all the packages. Um, 
That is not quite straightforward in OBS. So the approach that I've been taking is that I have um, prepared a across MIPSL GCC5 um, compiler package. I'm going to um, talk a bit more about cross compilers in general in um, the next presentation. And uh, with this particular build requires in your package, you can then add to the configure command line that normally we would just use the um, percent configure um, macro. We would add a, a dash dash host parameter to set the target to something that is not the usual um, build target. And in some cases, depending on how the, the cross compiler is uh, configured in packages, we might also need to override um, the, something like the CC variable or some special um, package specific configure argument or um, make variable in order to select like the, um, in this case, um, MIPSL, ZUSA Linux, GCC-5 package and not just with the um, prefix of the architecture in front of it. Then once uh, we proceed to the installation stage in the spec file, then instead of just using um, Dester, um, instead of just using Dester equals um, percent build root or um, RPM build root, um, we would just add um, a, a ZUS root component on that. That is um, slash uh, USR slash and then the, um, the triple for the particular architecture followed by slash ZUS root usually. That's how our um, bin utils is configured. And one important thing in the installation step is also to suppress any debug info handling. For one, we don't actually need debug info packages for these here. And the other issue is that the um, stripping and post-processing of those um, non-native binaries does not always work, actually. So sometimes you might end up with the broken binaries in the package. In particular, when um, you're dealing with um, a uh, binary that depends on a, a number of libraries, it makes um, perfect sense, or even if it's like libraries that depend on other cross-compiled libraries, it makes sense to add explicit requires um, for, for those package names, something that is usually forbidden for packages that you submit to, to factory. Um, that is because um, RPM does um, provides for the um, library names usually, but it does not understand that there are native and non-native binaries, and it will add the same provides name for, for both that are confusing um, OBS dependency handling. Um, in that same context, it may also um, be necessary to add um, prefer statements to the project config um, that you're in, uh, in the project that you're building in so that you um, still prefer the host versions of the libraries because it might otherwise say that it's got um, multiple packages that provide a certain um, SO library. And um, this um, happens in particular when we're dealing with um, building the actual GCC compiler for the target architecture, is that you will end up building the GCC um, dependency libraries such as uh, MPFR, MPC, and um, some other one. And then you have the, um, that you actually, the situation that you need not one or the other, but you actually need both installed. And that's why you need to then add um, explicit build requires for um, those library requires in addition to the prefers. Now, um, as far as an actual cross-compiled package goes, um, I have assumed that for testing purposes, I might actually want to install um, packages for multiple target actual um, for multiple target architectures in parallel. So that means that um, you can think about you want to um, cross-compile for both ARM and MIPS, or even if you're thinking about MIPS, then there may be different um, ABIs that you're targeting, such as MIPSL, uh, MIPS, MIPS64, MIPS64EL, or even more, um, depending if you look in, you know, there's um, ABI differences like uh, O64, N32, and so on. Um, there, you might want to have those in parallel, and that means that you need different naming schemes. Different naming schemes usually mean that you actually have to either um, create separate packages or use um, scripts to generate those um, particular spec files, um, and that's what um, I've taken here. So we have, as in 
some of the packages in OpenSUSE that you may have seen, um, there's a pre checkin script that takes a templated um, spec file, this one over here, and it generates um, several um, packages from it. So, for example, we would take a cross dash sad.spec.in and create a cross dash um, mipsl dash sed dash um, spec from, uh, from that one. We also need to have um, RPM um, lint RC files um, because otherwise there will be quite a lot of not just warnings but also errors about the um, binaries not being in the right path and um, post and post unhooks missing for um, LDD. Um, so um, yes, that is um, another um, component that's needed of every um, cross-compiled package. And then obviously you need to have um, a, a changes file simply to, to please um, OSC on check-in and it doesn't really need to have uh, much contents if you're doing that on your own, but um, you need to have it there and you need to um, copy it for the individual packages over by the um, check-in script. Um, of course, whenever there's a rule, there's exceptions to the rule. So um, in this case, um, SED is a uh, very simple um, example, whereas if we have the GCC package, then um, we will actually be using the GCC5 package to be building the cross MIPSL GCC5 package. Um, but if we actually, oh, and, and this um, resulting compiler would be the one that runs on the host architecture. But we also want a GCC compiler that runs on the target architecture. So basically, um, um, in addition to, to the original GCC5 package, I also needed a cross um, GCC5 package, and then I needed some, some different name. I know Canadian Cross is not quite the same, that's one step more complicated, but uh, I just needed a way to distinguish the two. Um, for many packages, this scheme works quite nicely, however, there are exceptions to that rule yet again. Um, the most notorious one is Perl, where the only way to officially build for different architecture is if you have an SSH connection to um, a machine of that architecture available that like your um, configure make files um, can um, actually um, connect to and get results back that have been um, executed natively. Um, the solution here is that there is a, a GitHub project called the Perl Cross, and uh, this is for a particular version of Perl, a set of patches on top that make those um, checks um, available in a way that work for, for real cross compilation. Because um, um, as you might have experienced, um, OBS, when building, um, runs, um, runs the builds in a sandbox so you don't have any network connection to the outside. At the end of this, you would have a package called cross-mipsl- um, and then the package name. Now our next goal is how do we actually get this package into a form that has the right name and installs the files to the right location. Um, in particular, we don't, uh, we'll have to relocate the files from uh, USR um, target triple sysroot to just um, the, the slash root. For this purpose, um, the setup I've chosen is to use one project per architecture because the outcome can, uh, can always be um, the, the, um, ex the um, package name that OBS and, or OpenSUSE particularly expects, um, which means that I can just use the project configuration to set the target architecture and some um, uh, things like that and can spare myself the generation of multiple spec files. Um, I would then just um, add a build requires for the cross package and then my trick here is to use RPM to um, first obtain um, the list of the files that are actually contained in the cross package and um, then um, use that list of files in order to um, move them from the original location to the um, install location where we have them, which is the, um, instead of on the last slide. Um, where do we have it? All 
right here. So um, we, we were installing to Destur build root sysroot, and now we just want to install to Destur build root. And um, for, uh, for simplicity, I've simply made this package no arch. Of course, that's, uh, that's a fake one and also needs an RPM lint RC file to suppress any, any um, warnings or errors for that. And um, in some cases, um, I've, uh, I've taken the step of not packaging them um, properly with lots of sub-packages, but simply packaging just um, them very quickly in one package. And in that case, I can just simply add additional provides like um, for develop packages or specific um, lib um, name 0, 1, or whatever version um, packages. Now, the full set of cross-compiled packages is this one. Um, this is quite similar to what you can see in the web interface of OBS. If you look at a um, project such as OpenSUSE colon factory, then if you click on a particular um, build repository, then it shows you a list of cycles. There's more than just with one. This is the, the base one that I've been looking into for, um, for MIPS. Um, I won't read all the package names. I hope you can still read it where you're sitting. Um, there are two that are in, uh, in braces here. The reason is that um, the way that I prepared my, um, um, my cross-compiler, I already um, named the packages and organized the packages in a way that um, I would already, um, by building the cross-compiler, have the packages um, for, for this uh, cross-compilation setup um, later on. And uh, also, while, while doing this, while um, some of this was, well, pretty stupid work on a couple of weekends and uh, some of the Christmas vacation days, um, I actually noticed that uh, there are some core packages that we may actually want to, to update in factories. So it seems that we're like two versions behind on some of the um, SE Linux uh, libraries. I'm not sure if there's a particular reason, but uh, maybe if someone knows, that would be nice um, if they can bring it up, whether this is uh, worth actually submitting or whether there's a particular um, um, incompatibility that we're um, dealing with. For now, I just uh, took the same versions um, as um, OpenSUSE does for, um, for safety. Um, in addition to that list of packages that you um, just saw, um, I also took um, a, a handful of uh, NOAJ packages simply from the um, OpenSUSE factory um, published um, repository from the download on OpenSUSE.org. Um, also, um, there were a few packages where I took the, um, the quick path, the, the shortcut of uh, simply taking a um, package of a different architecture, um, simply because there were no real um, architecture code in there, but just some architectural um, if, if arts in there for determining which um, config or, t or text files to um, put in there, such as is it, um, is it a 64-bit system or is it a 32-bit system, or there were like some specific um, configurations for, for SV90X in there that obviously I don't need when I'm dealing with other architectures. Even worse than that, um, in particular, when uh, I got to, to rebuilding packages, I, um, um, instead of just um, rebuilding um, all linked packages from OpenSUSE Factory, I uh, branched particular packages into my build repository. Um, examples were um, um, Autocon, Photomake, simply because um, the um, info, the um, Make info utility for, for uh, building the uh, documentation. Um, also has a second um, cyclic dependency that I was trying to, to get around here. And um, for, for that reason, I simply just patched packages to have less dependency so that they actually um, could um, start building with those set of, of cross compiled packages that I just uh, listed. And uh, apart from um, Apart from uh, not starting to build packages where you already know that they cannot possibly succeed, it also has the um, benefit that um, the scheduling is um, a little bit quicker and you may understand um, why I was looking into that um, in the next uh, section of the talk. So um, this is basically how I organized the packages so far and now the question is where do I actually build those packages? 
for specifically the main box architecture. Because um, if you look on uh, build.opensuther.org, you will notice that uh, we have um, schedulers for um, i586, x86-64, PPC-64 LE, PPC, PPC-64, um, S290X, ARMv6L, ARMv7L, and AR64. Um, there are no for MIPS or MIPS64. And the, the um, hypothetical question here is, well, do we have resources to build everyone's um, favorite project? So it's not really apparently provisioned that, you know, if someone says, hey, I want to do a port of OpenSUSE for an architecture that hardly anyone uses, that we can just get that set up on, on the main server. And um, also most prominently, I personally, even though I work for ZUSE, it doesn't mean that I actually have access to all those servers that this infrastructure is running on. So I can't just use the um, copy operations that I outlined on an earlier slide in order to import my binaries there. And in some cases, in case something goes wrong, I may also need to mess with either updating the QMB Linux user packages, um, configuring them for the um, bin format miss kernel module, and to do other stuff that require um, root permissions on the particular host machine. There, of course, is a relatively easy solution. OBS has a feature called Remote Link, which allows you to take um, an OBM server of your own, install it uh, wherever you are, not on the ZUSA network, uh, not necessarily, and connect it to the build.openzusa.org instance, or more specifically, api.openzusa.org, and um, have them obtain packages from there and kind of um, monitor what check-ins are being done there and automatically download all the sources and then do the building on, um, on your own hardware. That's the theory so far. Now, um, as for the practice, well, where would I install the OBS server to do my, um, my builds? And the fastest Intel machine that I have accessible is, well, this notebook right here, and for one, I want to disconnect this notebook from power once, it, once in time, and I also need to do other like larger compile jobs and so on that uh, consume CPU, so I uh, did not want to actually do this on, uh, on my own notebook. So some of it think this is a crazy solution. For me, it was a really cool thing to actually try out. Um, since uh, I've been working on the, the OpenSUSE ARM port myself, um, I do have a lot of ARM hardware um, standing around um, at home. And um, when I'm not um, actively working on the kernel or testing is whether something is working or broken, then they're either not connected to power or they're just uh, standing around and doing nothing. For example, I have like a DHCP server or things like that running on ARM boards, um, but they're not really using much. And I thought that's like a, you know, a CPU resource that um, under some constraints might actually be usable as, a, as OBS um, server. What I actually ended up choosing is the um, Firefly RK3288 board. Didn't bring it along today. Um, there's probably um, a, a image of that on the um, OpenSUSE wiki on the HCL pages. If not, then please bug me to um, finally update that. Um, the reason I chose that particular one is simply because it's got um, the, the only one that I had access to that has a Cortex-A17 CPU, which um, in theory is the fastest 32-bit CPU core that ARM provides. And um, to that, I plugged an external um, USB hard drive, um, not necessarily an SSD, I just took a, a regular hard drive and connected that via USB. In this case, there was no USB 3.0 available, so I had to take USB 2.0. And um, in case um, that uh, things were going well out, also had uh, larger ones um, prepared. Um, however, um, when I actually um, had that idea, um, there were no um, ARM binaries available for OBS to download. So I had um, OpenSUSE Tumbleweed running on um, that particular board, but uh, no OBS. So what I actually ended up doing is, um, because the only um, version of OBS that at the time was supporting OpenSUSE Factory, or, uh, well, the, the Tumbleweed repository, um, was OBS Server Unstable. So what I um, took is the packages from that particular repository, branched them so that they would um, build for um, a newly set up um, OpenSUSE Factory ARM repository um, for um, ARM v7L. And um, I ended up taking some in particular RubyGem packages from um, OpenSUSE Tumbleweed 
and then adding those packages that are not in Tumbleweed from the OBS server unstable repository at the time. Those were um, about 24 packages, many Ruby gems. There was a uh, Perl BS solve and um, the Apache um, mod, mod X forward package, I think. Um, by now, the situation um, has improved in that OBS Server Unstable is building um, OpenSUSE Factory ARM for both ARG64 and ARMv7L. So I've been able to um, delete most of the branch packages in the uh, weeks leading up to, to the conference. Um, one other aspect is that um, when we're looking at um, ARM boards, unlike um, Intel machines, um, only very few, unfortunately, have support for, for KVM. And the problem is usually not on the KVM side, but rather on the bootloader side, that simply um, they're booting the, um, the CPU in a um, mode that it does not have sufficient privileges to enter the um, hypervisor mode. Um, so, um, with only, um, there's like the, the Sun XI boards that um, have KVM enabled, and there's the Ondale board. Um, some uh, servers that are not on the, the market anymore from, uh, from Calseda, and that's roughly it. Um, so, the choice was that um, instead of um, KVM, I would be using chain root workers. And uh, this was not a problem because I was using a very um, select set of core packages where I was actually able to review that there was, at least on first sight, nothing um, um, malign in, in there that would actually um, damage the security of my onboard that I was using for, for little more than, uh, than testing the kernel anyway. Specifically, when using this combination of Tumbleweed and OBS Server Unstable Repository, um, from time to time there were either packages that were newer um, on the um, OSU side or on the Tumbleweed side. And uh, the main thing that was affected by that was, well, actually the only thing that was affected by that was the, the API server. So um, the, the backends are uh, written in Perl mostly and uh, just run. Um, there's uh, no real problems been there, but uh, the, the Ruby um, UI would, uh, would not come up in, in the web browser. So uh, what I figured out that was the, uh, the main issue was the gem file dot log in uh, this particular path here. And this actually says that a dependency of the OBS-API um, project, uh, well, sorry, of the, this particular web application is a package in a specific version. This is now not the one that I actually um, tested this with. This is the one that is, is current. So the gemfile.log um, currently says that um, it wants certain uh, Ruby on Rails packages in version 4.2.5.2, whereas Tumbleweed provides version 4.2.6. So basically, um, with, um, with simple um, regular expressions, I simply um, tweaked this, uh, this file to have the right versions, and the way to test whether this actually works was to simply run the rake command um, in that directory with the right uh, Ruby version. This worked pretty well. Initially, it, uh, it totally worked. Um, then at some point, um, MIME types was updated in Tumbleweed, and then it no longer worked. So the, um, the OBS um, API server was using uh, MIME types in Sun 1.0. Uh, whatever version. Um, Tumbleweed had version 2 that still worked fine and then it got updated to 3 and then suddenly it broke. That's a bit the risk in this um, um, scenario of using um, untested package versions. And um, of course this uh, risk could come from, from both sides so it was um, too dangerous to simply run zipper dupe, so I was very careful to usually first run zipper up to just um, um, have a much more control over um, which packages were coming from which repositories and avoiding that they would automatically um, switch the vendor from uh, one repository to another. Um, like I said, this worked fine until it broke, and unfortunately it broke like uh, one and a half weeks ago, and that is unfortunately the reason why I can't show you the nice um, web um, interface in a, a live demo here. 
Um, so, um, if you have any suggestions on how we might um, actually be uh, um, able to um, continue on with this port in the most sensible way in particular, um, since there's been at least one person that's shown interest in um, collaborating on this particular port during um, Hack Week next week. Um, one idea was that we might um, use a test instance of OBS elsewhere, but then again, the question is, which workers can we actually use um, to build um, the MIPS packages, which happens to be the next section. So, um, as described in the um, section before the last, um, I have managed to comp cross-compile a large set of packages that are needed for um, initial um, package building of OpenSUSE, OpenSUSE factory. Um, now, how do we actually build um, OpenSUSE factory with those particular packages for the MIPS architecture. In particular, um, we already have an OBS server. How do we actually set up OBS build workers for MIPS? And the main idea, the very simple one, naive one, is to simply run OBS workers on whatever hardware and setups we um, happen to have. So what might that be? If we uh, take a look at a random Linux distribution, then um, chances are that there is no OBS-worker package available, which is the easy way to install workers on the OpenSUSE distribution. Um, that works quite nicely. It's also a no-watch package with um, only a um, rather small set of dependencies. Um, unfortunately, OBS server, which was my first thought, was, you know, can I just build OBS worker for another um, distro in the build service? Unfortunately, it's built as part of OBS server, which has lots and lots of dependencies. Um, can someone get Adrian a microphone? I do have some more slides with workarounds of the problems in case you want to comment on that. <laughs> Not on? So, OB so OBS worker is actually only the init script. It downloads the code from the server and executes it. I will get to that in a minute. Okay, and sure. Okay, then. Okay. But so um, because it looked as if it had a lot of um, dependencies, I gave up on trying to to build this, in particular for for Debian in this case, and. Um, well, or at least the the, um, the second thought um, after seeing those dependencies was, you know, how do you actually build the package for a repository that you don't have, in particular when non and, and no arch um, packages are involved? And this is the um, the, uh, the creator CI20 package again. Um, it's running. Um, if you if you just uh, receive it, it's running a Debian Wheezy um, system with the uh, Mipsel um, ABI. Um, I did not really see the, the benefits of trying to import um, a whole Debian um, distribution into the OBS just in order to build an OpenSUSE distribution, so I wondered whether there was a simpler way, and as you already heard from Adrian, there is a simpler way. Um, and the simple way is to simply learn and understand what the OBS worker actually is doing. So this particular board here, the um, Crater CI20 happens to have um, a gigabyte of RAM, which is um, compared to too many other ARM um, devices that um, people like um, Max Reinhardt have been um, working on is um, quite a lot for, um, for MIPS purposes. Um, for um, reasons that I don't want to, to further go into is I upgraded from uh, Debian 7 to, to Debian 8 to have certain package dependencies available. There's instructions for this particular board available on the elinux.org wiki. On the elinux.org wiki. Um, and then from the OpenSUSE tools repository, I managed to install the um, build um, package and some of its dependencies, which again was using also other dependencies that were already available in the Debian Arc uh, distribution. Um, 
what it really needs to do is it simply gets the Perl um, code for running the worker from the uh, repository server, from your local one. So you can simply um, just uh, look up uh, what it does on the file system, and that's pretty much a curl command to download from this particular with the cursor. Uh, here it is. Um, to, uh, to download the code, and then um, it is being downloaded as a CPIO archive, and then you just extract that to um, some, uh, some local temporary directory of yours. Um, there's also a few um, post uh, download steps that are simply just copied from that script as well, and then I used a simplified uh, command line for the BS worker script in order to launch the local um, instance, in this case, um, just one, um, since it's got a, a dual core setup with, um, yes, uh, two, two jobs specified for, for both cores. And yes, th those are just like uh, local directories in the file system where various um, files are going to get um, installed. So since we now know um, how OBS Worker is actually working. I had the problem, um, and maybe Adrian, I don't know if that is a problem that's already been solved or not. Um, I ran into the issue that sometimes my workers would um, get a build job dispatched, but instead of receiving the, um, the source code of the packages, the, the usual way, there's like a three-step um, status output that they show initially, it was just getting binary garbage. And in particular, at times, those um, binary um, um, sequences would also contain like the control A sequence that the uh, screen um, command uh, uses to set, for instance, the title or some other attributes of the um, running um, screen session. Um, I found that very annoying and I set out to write a um, systemd service for that. So the setup that I've um, tested in uh, the package, which by the way is in my um, home A underscore Farber um, branch, um, some, uh, I think it's branches OBS server unstable, I'm available for anyone that uh, wants to peek at that, um, is I simply um, separate it into, into two service files, one for the, the boot code download that we just saw, and the other one for running the, the actual um, for running the actual change root service in this particular case, because I didn't actually use, ended up using a KVM on, on my build workers. I didn't set out to, to set a, a worker for those as well, but um, in, in theory it should all work in the same way that you um, configure um, the systemd service unit file in the way that is appropriate for the command that you're about to, to launch and then use some um, variables in order to um, have a, a placeholder for um, what it should actually be using. Then you can set the environment equal setting of the service unit file um, in order to have some defaults. By the way, there is a nice blog post from, um, from Derex on nordisch.org where you can read up on, on some of those systemd concepts. And then you can actually have a file in Etsy, systemd, system, um, service name .d, slash, in this case, service.conf, uh, where you can override those values with new values. So basically, you would have like a default of um, localhost.52.52, uh, .52, and then in my case, I would say that in fold of in, in, in place of localhost 5252, I would take um, uh, felt.lin.colon uh, 5252. Yes, and it also um, um, gives a bit more flexibility in that you can simply use the uh, instance name here. That's what the uh, what the add sign in this service here is about, is that you can actually have multiple instances of this running. So you can either just have a uh, change root at one, as it was uh, as it used to be, or you could actually use um, a name, and in theory that should work just uh, the same. Any immediate comments you, you have on that, Adrian? Um, it's good that someone is working on system files. Could you please speak up? It's, it's great that someone is working on system files mm -hmm. for that, uh, but that 
sounds like you are ignoring all, all configurations in, in etc sysconfig OBS server. That is correct, yes. So why do you do that? I mean, isn't it... I mean, now you, we would need for each kind of, of virtualization, we need own service files, right? It mm -hmm. would make it much, much more complex. Well, basically the reason was, or one of the reasons was, that I did not want to run the BS worker script because it was not working as I described. In particular, it kept, you know, having this problem that um, um, it was um, badly affecting the screen process, which is, you know, what it does at the end, and it spawns, and therefore I couldn't reuse the BS worker script. Okay. I have no clue about uh, binary garbage, by the way. It must be a bug somewhere, but so it needs um, debugging. And then. It, it might be possible to reuse the Etsy sysconfig obs-server file, um, to, to initialize some of that, either to have like a script that takes it as an input and generates those um, systemd um, config files in Etsy or uses some Zimbling um, facility. I just simply did not spend a lot of cycles on that. Um, I would really like to have the systemd files, but not for surprise that everything is incompatible. So we should really keep the sysconfig. Sure, but the, the main thing here is that um, I am relying on systemd not just to have like the um, old-fashioned um, script that you already have being wrapped in a systemd um, service unit, but I really wanted to um, think about how can we actually improve things in a only systemd world. And in particular, that means that in a, a difference to the BS worker script, I've separated the boot code download, which is like an, an if, somewhere at the beginning of the, the BS worker script from that particular file, and that also means that um, I thought it would be easiest to have separate f um, um, service files for what the particular workers would actually be doing, because there's a whole lot of um, configuration settings and parameters that only apply to one of them, but not for the other. For example, um, if you take a look at the... Uh, um, at the command line down here, I don't need to specify any kernels simply because for a change root, I don't use any kernels. And there's, I don't know, like at least a handful of like variables and settings um, that simply don't apply to, to everything. So basically what you are saying is that uh, you would favor just an um, obs-worker at dot service, or is it this split that you are also opposed to? No, the split is fine, I think. It's, it's just yeah. that I... I mean, we, and we need a migration point, and if you switch from Xen to KVM, that you rewrite all your configuration, it makes no sense mm -hmm. for me, because it's same memory usage, same, and so on. Sure. So that's, yeah. There might obviously be ways to simply share those environment variables between the two services. It's the question, what is easier? In this case, I mean, there is a reason why this is um, a dot .service file that is um, in my home repository and not a commit that I've made to the OBS build server um, Git repository. So it's not really consumable by everyone, but it was just um, a path that I have um, explored in order to make it easier to bring, or at least more and more stable, to have um, workers running on, uh, on uh, some of my hosts. Um, another idea was that um, if I have like this 64-bit um, um, MIPS box, um, the uh, was previously called on Kickstarter the iGuardian, and then it was in this case called the Shield, but now it's called the Shield Pro. It's running on a Octeon 3 um, processor, and that is one that actually supports hardware virtualization, which was interesting to me as a virtualization developer. Um, and then also, um, I uh, recently uh, received this particular board from, from Asia RF, which has a MediaTek MIPS SOC. Um, and then I also, as part of previous hack weeks, uh, was taking apart various um, routers, which is like the number one source of devices in the world where you find MIPS processors still. Um, and there's kind of like a range of, of specs that you will find there. So one gigabyte of RAM obviously is, well, 
we've, we've been able to deal with that to some degree on, on ARM boards. Obviously, two would be better, but if we only have one, that works as well. 128 megabytes might actually work for running OpenSUSE at some point, um, but 32 megabytes well, are probably too little, not just to run on there, but in particular when it's about um, building things like um, you know, GCC and other large packages. Um, most of those um, boards come with either OpenWRT or just some custom BusyBox-based system. Um, in case uh, you're not familiar with BusyBox, that's like an all-in-one static executable which contains both um, shell functions and some of the um, functionality that we find in like uh, core utils and other um, external packages in OpenSUSE. Um, and it usually means that in that setup there's very little tools available. In particular, you usually will not find Perl, and the, um, the BS worker script obviously uses Perl to, uh, to run in various um, Perl modules. Um, so one thought that I have not yet investigated is whether it might actually work to take the packages that I have cross-compiled myself in the, the previous stack and just put them into such a um, busy box build system in order to complement the binaries or maybe just boot into that particular um, file system constructed from, um, from those um, core packages? Um, or would it be worth to take such a um, busy box or open wrt based system and have another mips based distribution with perl and other dependencies on there um, there's always you know a trade off of you know how much time does it actually cost me um, to to learn about different um, distros and how they're set up and how things are going to work as opposed to can i just work around that on the open source side and in particular, since I happen to work on QMU, it was uh, quite easy for me to just use emulation on a different architecture, in this case, um, on the ARM architecture, um, to emulate um, MIPS binaries using, um, in that case, QMU-MIPSL uh, um, on the OpenSUSE um, factory ARM systems. Um, to do so, I would just um, aggregate the host's QMU Linux user package um, have an export filter so that it actually gets um, exported from uh, RMB7HL in this case to um, the MIP scheduler. And um, then in the um, project configuration, we also need to set the host architecture that a particular repository, if you make a, um, a specific um, conditional for that, um, actually gets dispatched to by the OBS dispatcher. And then as the next step, um, also have inside the change root the uh, QMB Linux user package pre-installed. Um, actually, the uh, build tool nags about the absence of a build init VM or MV7, either HL or L um, package. Um, I found that um, if I actually construct such a package, it does not work for the very simple reason that on each start of a build job, it will try to re-register all the bin format um, handling, and that fails if there is already a handler uh, registered for a particular ELF um, magic string, or um, sorry, for, for the name of that particular um, architecture. So what I ended up doing is to have a simple um, shell script that was based on our uh, QMU. Can't quite remember the name. So in the SBIN directory, there is a particular script installed by the QMU Linux user package, which does that. I just grabbed the line which was specific to uh, MIPSL. Um, for the very simple reason that there is a bug in that script in that two architectures, I think MIPSL and MIPS, N32 or something like that. Oh no, MIPS and MIPSL actually have the same, whatever exact two architectures, two of them had the same magic string and that made the registration fail. So that's the reason why I choose a, a manual script for that and I simply use the, the boot local script um, that's integrated into systemd to um, start that automatically whenever the um, build worker starts. Now finally to uh, what you've probably been waiting for with uh, five minutes left. Um, the status of where we are. So don't be too excited about it. Um, 
MIP64, that would have been for, um, for this board. I have uh, um, not yet really focused at, um, simply because I don't have a, a full system where I can uh, really um, actively test that yet. Um, I have been mostly cross-compiling the uh, MIP64 packages alongside MIPSL, um, simply because I wanted to avoid that I um, in the skeletons that I used for, for creating all those cross-compiled packages, um, hard code MIPSL everywhere, so I wanted to be able to also have like the right directory locations um, for, um, for the 64-bit ones. And then also I was unsure about should I be using MIP64 or MIP64EL. Maybe someone in the audience has opinions on that at the end. Um, one, one concern I had was that uh, this box here has a big Endian kernel and it did not have the file utility um, in the, the BusyBox um, file system to actually check whether um, the binaries that they were using were uh, big Endian or little Endian. And the other um, concern, of course, is that um, is it a good idea to try to build big Endian binaries on little Endian systems such as x86 or ARM? So let's move on to, to MIPSL. Um, my OBS instance, before it uh, stopped working, was able to build pre-install images. So that means that like the core um, packages, the very core set of cross-compiled packages were working sufficiently enough. And um, I could also start actual um, package builds. Um, I could also use the OSC utility with um, appropriate um, commands with an alternative uh, project um, to, um, um, to st build packages. Um, or start building packages on the ARM architecture. That's where I, uh, I tried it locally. Um, and I could also um, use the OSC change root command in, uh, once the, the build had failed in order to get into that system and interactively and play with, with those packages. Um, once I had such a um, extracted um, build change root, um, I was also able to just uh, transfer that build root onto the um, onto this 32-bit onboard here. Um, at the time, I did not yet have the um, OBS um, build worker um, running there, so I just simply um, used um, SCP to uh, transfer a, a tarball over there and extract that in there and do the the, the change root manually. Um, that also worked, and the results between the emulated system on ARM and the native MIPSL system were almost the same. So I believe the only difference that I saw was that like the command line editing was working in the change root environment on um, ARM with the emulation, and it was kind of broken on, on the Debian system. Um, also, um, some easy packages um, were... Um, succeeding to, well, almost succeeding to build, or at least it was succeeding to build and install and were then failing with some segfault or whatever exactly in the post-build scripts. Um, and um, what I in particular um, noticed was that, for example, if I were taking a um, very simple um, binary such as hostname, I think, um, then there were... Um, Packaging issues starting to appear simply because um, the cross-build packages that I used initially were based on the upstream tarballs and not on the um, open source factory packages, which turn out to have at least 20 packages on to uh, 20 patches on top of our RPM package in order to tweak the, the runtime behavior, the configuration of you know what it, it generates automatically, how it handles certain architecture names, and so on. So um, it did not immediately work. So therefore, I was focusing on getting the um, RPM package rebuilt inside um, this particular setup. And unfortunately, so far, um, before things um, started to um, completely break, um, I failed with um, the automate, uh, automake um, script simply unexpectedly returning at some point. So I'm assuming that some tool like um, SED or, or something that is being invoked in there um, was not um, yet um, working as expected. So that mostly completes this talk. Um, what questions are there? Have you, have you considered... Please do, up. 
Have you, have you considered doing the initial bootstrap using real hardware instead and using the foreign distro mechanism instead of going cross-compiling? Um, did you attend the beginning of the talk? Not quite. I was held up elsewhere. Okay, because I had um, shown slides about various approaches and one was the QME Excel approach that I was speaking about and um, I had also um, looked into just using um, RPM build on, on Debian 7 for building like um, packages, but um, that led to, in, in particular around um, glibc, it was using um, provides um, that our packages uh, were not um, very happy with. So it was like, I don't know, was it using a different scheme or different versioning, or there was some different that was incompatible between the two. Did you mean something else? No, that's exactly it. Okay. Um, in fact, this is the approach I was yeah. using, like... Please speak up. Please no, speak I, up. I, I, did, I didn't expect anything else. In fact, this oh. is the mechanism I used about four years ago when I started working on uh, OpenSUSE for Spark. Okay. Yeah, um, one, one idea, so Andreas Schwab is also one of those uh, um, a handful of experts who've been uh, using with, with porting um, OpenSUSE to different parts, apart from you. Um, he was suggesting that I could just take like the operating system um, and just, you know, like throw it into one big RPM file with, you know, lots of provides or something like that. But, well, the, the root effects that I had from Debian was like two gigabytes and I didn't really feel like throwing all of that into one RPM package and then, you know, constantly reinstalling that. More questions? So maybe a quick survey from the, the people who are sitting in the audience who either has some device that is running MIPSL or would be interested in running OpenSUSE on some random MIPS device. So I'm seeing up to three, okay, four, four hands. So obviously that's not a whole lot, but yeah, there, there were some people that, that might have been interested. So um, we'll just have to see in, in which place we can, uh, I can actually transfer the, um, um, the stuff that I have in order to, uh, to allow collaboration. So, so one idea um, that Adrian brought up was to have like a test OBS server instance running somewhere that's separate from, um, from the main OBS instance or um, some VPN or whatever set up to, uh, to, to, uh, to make that work uh, in some way. Further questions? Or is, um, apart from Jan, anyone else here um, considering doing a port to a different architecture? Well, the problem of porting to any other architecture than those what we already have is that uh, few people there is, hardware is hard to get at. So either it's overly pricey as a, for hobbyists, mm -hmm. and or you get some crazy segmentation fault in the compiler which you don't know how to fix, and because there's no developer either, you're kind of stuck in that sense. So yeah, what I was kind of hinting at here, so there's a couple of architectures that would be supported in QMU for long cross um, architectures. One that I was recently getting uh, bugged about with uh, CC mails is that someone was working on getting the um, TileGX emulation in QMU up to speed with the um, GCC test suite. Um, there is like open risk. There is also K1OM. This was the current night's landing preview something. Okay which is more or less x86, but again, there is the problem, how long is it going to be supported? Um, are you compiler? saying there's, there's a hard, uh, sorry, there's a, the hardware as an interesting target, or are you saying there's a QMU port for that? Hardware as an interesting hardware, target, okay. because it's fast and you can do native builds, which I think is a lot better than trying QMU in any way. So I would personally also be interested in that particular one. Um, I just haven't had my hands on any night standing hardware myself. D do you have any? No. Okay. Okay. Any any further questions or comments? Quite possible that I'm doing something totally stupid and could have spared work, but uh, 
This was what I came up with, and like I said, it's one of those topics we don't really have a whole lot of documentation on how to do this because oh. it's not done so frequently. Okay. Yes, please. Are you aware of the auto conf how to make feature uh, that uh, that makes possible to make a cache of the uh, of the target? Uh, please hold it closer to the mouth. It's very hard to hear here. I ever that uh, that conf configure based on uh, the auto make is capable uh, to to create a cache of configure results on on a host machine, so you can copy uh, config dot cache to the tar target machine, and uh, the configure script could uh, reuse it. Um, I believe in some cases I may have had to resort to that. Yes, I think I put that inside the the spec file. You know, like having. So it, it was definitely, I think it was less than five packages out of that very long list. Yes, it's often broken. It's often broken out of the box. Uh, just, just the configurer doesn't, doesn't check for everything on, on the target and, uh, and don't uh, use cache for it. Yes, so if, if anyone is like an upstream maintainer or, um, or cares about this particular topic, then please feel free to um, patch various upstream packages to not rely on those host checks, but rather to use like um, a test compilation. There's even very cool ways to figure out whether you're running big engine or little in the, no, sorry, not whether you're running little engine, whether you're actually building for big or little engine simply by doing like a binary um, grab for, um, for a certain um, 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 string or sequence of numbers that you actually used in, in the source code. So there's examples for many of those out there if you're unsure and um, yeah, it's uh, definitely the, the only way that that really works universally. If there's no further questions, then thank you very much for your interest. And um, the next talk will be about building and uh, making available cross-compilers for um, OpenSUSE Tumbleweed.